This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Conflict of Heroes, Storms of Steel, the third edition. Conflict of Heroes, Storms of Steel was released in 2019 by Academy Games and designed by Uwe Eichart and Gunter Eichart. This game supports up to four players and takes from one to four hours to play. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules tutorial series for Conflict of Heroes Storms of Steel. In this next episode of Advanced Rules, we're going to look at vehicles. This video will cover pages 28 through 31 of the rulebook and includes topics such as vehicle types, using them to load, transport, and unload other units, combat rules, and special vehicle types. These rules will prepare you to play Mission 7, Wounded Tiger, Mission 8, Graveyard, and Mission 9, Black Knights of the Steppe. So, if you've mastered the previous video and you're ready for more, then let's get started. In this episode, we're going to talk a lot about vehicles. The good news is that most of the core rules regarding vehicle units follow the same structure of what we already have learned about foot units. For example, vehicle unit counters have the same general layout as foot unit counters. Divide a vehicle counter in half and you'll still find that the upper section is dedicated to action cost and navigation and the lower half is reserved for combat abilities. The main difference with the vehicle counter is in regards to movement. Vehicle movement is divided into two categories based on traction. Wheeled vehicle movement abilities are color-coded green, and tracked vehicles in blue. You'll also notice icons below the movement cost stat. These icons indicate the vehicle's bonus movement ability. Essentially, the number of additional hex spaces a vehicle can move when traversing ideal terrain like roads. Also be aware that vehicles have different defense ratings based on their type. Light vehicles and field guns are treated similar to foot units and have red defense ratings. And armored vehicles have blue defense ratings. Since the layout and rules are mostly the same between foot units and vehicle units, let's talk about some of the differences. First of all, regarding close range and defense rating bonuses. Vehicles are large cumbersome machines and as a result do not receive defensive terrain bonus in close combat. The background behind this rule is that vehicles do not use terrain as well for cover as foot units, and as a result cannot take advantage of them in close combat where multiple vehicle units are occupying the same hex. However, if foot units occupy the same hex space as friendly vehicles, they receive a plus one defense rating bonus. Historically, and as we've seen many times in movies, Foot units often advance with tanks, hugging them for cover from incoming fire. As for combat, vehicles also experience some limitations in regards to elevation. Tanks may not attack down steep terrain or cliffs into an adjacent hex. However, they may attack up. As you may recall from the last video, steep terrain is two elevation levels higher or lower and cliffs are three levels higher or lower. The reason behind this rule is that tanks could raise their main guns quite high but could not depress them enough to fire down a steep cliff face. This represents a blind spot weakness for tanks and other mounted vehicle weapons. Next, we're gonna take a closer look at vehicles with their bonus movement ability. In an earlier episode, we discussed terrain movement cost as it relates to foot units. With vehicles, the overall movement calculation remains the same. The vehicle sums their base movement cost and any stress with the cost of the hex's terrain to arrive at a total cost. That total movement cost is then mapped to the spent check table and a custom 10-sided die is rolled to see if afterwards the unit becomes spent. However, Vehicles handle terrain differently than foot units, and as a result, the terrain cost to enter a hex may be more or less than you're accustomed to. Wheeled units also suffer terrain limitations compared to tracked units. Extremely steep or rugged terrain may prohibit the movement of vehicles altogether regardless of their traction type. 
This chart shows the vehicle cost for each terrain type. Note that wheeled vehicles cannot enter hexes with wood terrain or marshes. Finally, neither vehicle type can enter steep terrain, rivers, small balkas, or anti-tank ditches. Keep these rules and cost figures in mind when calculating movement costs for vehicles versus foot units. In Storms of Steel, one of the advantages of vehicles is increased movement. This is represented by a vehicle's bonus moves ability. Vehicles make best use of their bonus movement ability on roads. After a vehicle moves into an adjacent hex on a road with regular movement, they may then conduct bonus moves. As stated earlier, wheeled vehicles have a green bonus movement icon, and tracked vehicles have blue bonus movement icons. Some vehicles, like half-tracks, have both. Each icon on the vehicle counter indicates the additional spaces they may move with that type of traction. For example, with continuous movement on a road, the T-34 tank can move a total of three spaces one hex space for the tank's regular movement, and then two additional hex spaces for the two bonus move icons. Under normal road conditions, the Maltier half-track would have the same range. One hex space on the half-track's initial move, and two additional hex spaces for each bonus move icon. Now, let's discuss where these bonus move abilities of wheeled and track vehicles diverge. Wheeled vehicles cannot enter a road hex space with a bonus move if there is road congestion. Road congestion means the next road hex space contains another vehicle counter. Remember though, wheeled vehicles are not prevented from entering a congested road hex space if it's their first move, only bonus moves. Tracked vehicles are not stopped by road congestion. I assume that tracked vehicles just power around the traffic jam on the road's muddy shoulder. Keeping this in mind, tracked vehicles' greater off-road capabilities allow them to conduct bonus moves in open fields, corn, and wheat. This gives them a lot more maneuverability on the battlefield than a wheeled vehicle. However, keep in mind that bonus moves come with several limitations. No bonus moves are allowed if the vehicle's first move entered a hex with difficult terrain, heavy smoke, they were moving backwards, or the vehicle was hidden. Let's review difficult terrain for wheeled and tracked vehicles. For wheeled vehicles, difficult terrain are hexes with either wood or stone buildings, or if the hex contains heavy smoke. With tracked vehicles, add wood hexes to this list. Also remember, there are differences in terrain that vehicles cannot enter at all. For wheeled vehicles, this is wood hexes, small balkas, steep terrain, and anti-tank ditches. With tracked vehicles, the list is the same with the exception of wood hexes, which are considered difficult terrain. Before we move on to the next topic, some final notes on vehicle stacking. In general, vehicles may move into and or out of a hex occupied by a friendly or enemy unit, with regular or bonus moves. The exception here being for wheeled vehicles and road congestion. Also, a vehicle moving through an enemy occupied hex, into and out of a hex in the same turn utilizing bonus moves, cannot be engaged in close combat. Another important vehicle ability is that they can be used to transport or tow other units. A vehicle may be used to transport one foot unit or tow one field gun or another vehicle that has a stunned hit marker or an immobilized hit marker. When a vehicle tows another vehicle, the traction type becomes very important. A wheeled vehicle can be pulled by any other vehicle, including wagons. However, tracked vehicles can only be towed by other tracked vehicles. Now, whether it be foot units or field guns, there are two ways to load or limber these units to another vehicle. The first way is if the unit that is to be transported is in the same hex. This process can also be used to tow vehicles that are stunned or immobilized. First, pay the loading unit's move cost. 
When doing this in the same hex space, ignore difficult terrain penalties, but include any stress penalties. Next, to help remember the status of these units, position the transported unit on top of the transport unit. And make sure that the transported unit has the same facing as the transporting unit. Finally, make a single group spent check. The second way a unit can be loaded onto a transport is from an adjacent hex. When this occurs, the first step is to pay the loading unit's move cost, but include any difficult terrain penalty and any stress penalty. The remainder of the load process remains the same as before. Now that we know how to load or limber a unit, let's look at transporting them. When transporting or towing a unit with a vehicle, the units become linked and must take group actions and spent checks together. However, when a vehicle transports a unit, certain actions may or may not be available. A transported unit conducts a move action as a group action with the transporting unit. The transported unit, though, cannot conduct an attack action. The transported unit conducts rally actions and stall actions with the transport. And while transported, they cannot use any of their unique abilities. The transporting unit has all their usual actions that it will be conducted as a group action. They also have the ability to hide, which also hides the transported unit. Finally, let's discuss some rules about attacking a transporting vehicle. When making attack rules, first resolve the attack against the transported unit and then the transporting vehicle. Also be aware the transporting vehicle and the transported units receive all-terrain defense modifiers for the hex. And, in the event that the transporting vehicle is destroyed, the transporting unit immediately is unloaded at no cost and placed into a hex facing any direction the player chooses. So keep these rules in mind when transporting units come under fire in combat. Finally, let's discuss the unloading process, which is essentially the reverse of the loading process. Like loading, there are two ways to conduct this maneuver. The first unit is to unload in the same hex, and the second way is to unload into an adjacent hex. The process to unload is as follows. First, place the unit facing in any direction, under the vehicle in the same hex, or in any adjacent hex. Second, pay the unloading unit's move cost and be sure to include difficult terrain penalty and any stress. Third and finally, make a single group spent check. And now you know how to load, transport, and unload units and vehicles. In early missions, where the battles are fielded mostly by soldiers, hit markers are pretty straightforward. Since everything's a soft target, you use red hit markers for just about everything. However, once vehicles and more substantial weapons enter the fray, it can get a little murky on which hit marker to use. The key rule, though, when applying hit markers is to follow the color. If the unit has red defense ratings, apply red hit markers. If the unit has blue defense ratings, apply blue hit markers. The confusing part, well at least for me, is that there are vehicles and large weapons that have red defense ratings and use the red hit markers. This includes field guns, if you think about it, these are just large crude weapons, trucks, and one German half-track called the Maltier, which is really just a glorified truck. This puts most of the other vehicles squarely in the armored target category. However, with war games, there's always exceptions, and Storms of Steel is no different. In this case, it's open-top vehicles like APCs. Open-top vehicles can be identified by a red border around their defense rating. These armored vehicles operate as armored targets, except under special circumstances where the crew is especially vulnerable. Attacks that contain high explosives, flamethrowers, snipers, and red firepower close combat all can severely impact the crew. Under these cir circumstances, with an open-top vehicle, players will use the red hit markers. Hopefully, this diagram clarifies the specific hit markers to use with each unit type. 
Next, let's learn more about armored hit markers. Armored units use a separate set of blue hit markers to represent morale and equipment damage. The combat and application rules for these blue hit markers remain the same as the red hit markers. When an armored unit is hit, the player that owns it draws a blue hit marker and secretly learns the results, then places it face down on the unit. From this point, a second hit marker will destroy the armored unit. However, the effect of the markers and whether a player can rally it off the unit is more complex. Let's take a look. Blue armored hit markers are divided into three types. First are morale-based hit markers. These affect the unit's crew. Similar to red hit markers, these blue hit markers can be removed with a successful rally action. The second type is the one instant death hit marker in the set. If the player pulls this one, the unit is immediately destroyed. The third category, and the majority of the armored hit markers in this set, are damage hit markers. When an armored unit receives one of these, the vehicle is permanently damaged. These damage hit markers cannot be rallied off the unit. Once placed, they remain until the end of the mission. So, as you can see, although armored units are stronger, they are not invulnerable and can quickly accumulate hit markers that impact their functionality and ultimately destroy them. Keep these rules in mind when assigning hit markers to units in combat. Let's take a look at specific vehicle types beginning with transports. Transports are not usually designed for combat. They're the workhorses of the battlefield, often carrying troops. The first type of transport are trucks. Trucks are wheeled units that will often have no real attack range or capability. They can only conduct combat at close range and at a substantial penalty. I'm assuming when this happens, the driver just jumps out of the cab and tries to club someone with a wrench. There are also some specific rules regarding trucks. When a truck is destroyed, the player does not adjust the caps track. However, they do count the destroyed truck for VP scoring. Next up are half tracks. Although these vehicles have tracks, they're treated as a wheeled unit which means they may not move into places impassable to wheeled units, like woods hexes. The advantage of half-tracks, however, are that they do have the tractability for one bonus move. However, like trucks, half-tracks have no real range or offensive capability. They can only conduct close combat. Finally, there are armored personnel carriers, or APCs. Despite the front wheels, APCs are considered full-tracked units. One major difference from their counterparts are that APCs often have offensive capabilities. The APC unit pictured here has a mounted MG42. There is another APC with a mounted mortar unit. Another advantage of APCs over traditional trucks or half-tracks is they're fully armored and provide considerable defense to their crew. Foot units receive a plus two defense rating bonus as indicated by the shield icon. However, one disadvantage to APCs is they have an open top and are vulnerable to attack. This is indicated by the red bordered flank defense rating. This means the unit is vulnerable to high explosives, flamethrowers, red firepower close combat attacks, and snipers. Next, let's take a look at weaponized vehicles. Now, let's talk about vehicles that are primarily used as weapons. These vehicle types are designed for combat first and as a result are often equipped with armored defenses. First, let's discuss turreted vehicles. These are the units we most think of when we hear the term tank. The key advantage of turreted vehicles is that they can swivel their primary weapon 360 degrees without changing their facing. You can tell a vehicle has a turret by the white circle behind its attack cost. However, while turreted vehicles have a capability of 360 degree attack, if they want to fire out of their normal green firing arc, they must pay an additional two action points to attack beyond the normal angle. Next up are self-propelled guns, also known as SPGs. SPGs are not turreted vehicles. 
If an SBG wants to acquire a target beyond its normal 120 degree angle, they must pivot their vehicle. Finally, there are vehicles classified as anti-air units. You can tell a vehicle has AA defenses by the blue circle behind its attack rating. Anti-air units may attack aircraft within its normal green firing arc. It's also important to note that anti-aircraft vehicles may also be turreted and acquire targets out of their normal firing arc by paying an additional two action points. Once again, turreting capability can be determined by the white circle behind the attack cost. However, one disadvantage to some vehicles in this class are that they may be open-topped and vulnerable to attack. If a vehicle has anti-air capabilities, also be sure to check the defense rating to see if there's a red border. The red border means that the vehicle is open-topped. As you can see, there are a lot of nuances to vehicles in Storms of Steel, which can seem a little overwhelming at first. But once you become familiar with the differences, add a lot of depth to gameplay. Storms of Steel also provides players with limited access to airplanes that are represented by airplane weapon cards. Airplanes are made available to players in specific missions similar to offboard artillery. During the scheduled round in the mission, the player activates their airplane with a card action. The airplane counter is then added to the map for a one-time strike. Let's familiarize ourselves with the airplane stats and then take a look at an example. The layout of an airplane weapon card is similar to that of artillery cards. The action card icon and airplane type is listed at the top. Attack ratings are shown on the left side of the card. And the right side of the card has the attack range. At the bottom of the card is the card ID and a high explosive icon. This means that the airplane attack with high explosives are resolved against a target's flank defense. And units with a red flank defense do not receive the plus two defense rating bonus from the woods due to air bursts. Let's walk through an air attack example to see how all this works. In this example, a German Panzer Grenadier unit and an SDKFZ vehicle unit are making their way up a country road all out in the open. The Soviet player decides to launch an air attack to take advantage of this opportunity. To conduct an air attack action, first place the airplane counter on a map hex of the player's choice. Second, if the player has any units in range with anti-air capabilities, they may respond by attacking the airplane. The German SDKFC does in fact have anti-air capabilities, and the player does intend to respond. The Soviet Sturmovik plane is not in the SDKFC's normal arc of fire. However, the German vehicle is equipped with a turret, so it can swivel its guns to face the plane for an extra cost of two action points. Next, a battle equation is conducted to see if the airplane is hit. The attack is coming through the Sturmovik's front defense hexes, so the 13 is used. This defense rating of 13 is subtracted from the SDKFZ's anti-aircraft attack rating of 5 for a hit number of 8. The German player must now meet or beat this hit number of 8. The German player rolls two six-sided dice and the result is a 5, a miss. If the German player had hit the plane with its anti-aircraft fire, then it would have been repulsed and the air attack would have ended. However, the AA defense failed, and now the Sturmovik is allowed to attack the two hexes in front of it. Regardless of whether the AA attack failed or succeeded, the German player must now make a spin check for the SDKFC unit that spent four action points. The die result is a six, and the unit is not spent. In the next step, the Soviet player now completes a separate attack against the Panzer Grenadier unit and the SDKFZ vehicle. First, the Soviet Sturmovik attacks the German Panzer Grenadier unit. The Panzer Grenadier's red flank defense of 11 is subtracted from the Soviet Sturmovik's red attack rating for soft targets of 6. This means the hit number is 5. The Soviet player rolls the dice and the result is a 6, a hit. 
The German player then draws a red hit marker because it's a soft target, sneaks a peek to see what it is, and then places it on the Panzer Grenadier unit. Next, let's resolve the Soviet Stromovix attack to the German SDKFZ vehicle. Now this one is a little more complicated. If you notice, the German SDKFZ is an open-topped vehicle. This is signified by the red border around its flank defense rating. Normally, the flank is considered armored. However, in the event that the attack is high explosive, a flamethrower, or the result of a red firepower close combat attack, then the armored flank defense is treated as a red soft target defense. Therefore, the SDKFZ's 11 defense rating minus the Stromovix 6 attack rating because it's a soft target equals a 5 hit number. The Soviet player rolls the dice and scores a 12, which is definitely a hit. But wait, it gets better. Instead of a blue hit marker for armored targets, the German player draws a red hit marker, since technically, and according to the rules, this is a soft target due to the open-topped vehicle. And now, with the second attack completed, the airplane air attack is resolved. The Soviet player removes the airplane counter, and now it's the German player's turn. Finally, let's talk about field guns. Field guns are crew-served units designated with names like Gun, Pack, ATG, or Flak. While they're not motorized, field guns use green-wheeled movement. You'll also notice the movement cost for field guns is particularly high, as the crew manning it must lug it into a new position. For serious redeployment, players should consider towing the field gun with another vehicle, as mentioned earlier. Also note, while this is a large piece of equipment, it is not an armored unit. If this unit is hit in combat, players use red hit markers. With the rules covered in this tutorial, you are now ready to play missions 7, 8, and 9. In the final episode of this series, we will finish the last set of rules that will enable playing all the remaining missions. This will be the rules for fortifications, obstacles, and flamethrowers. So once you've mastered the missions covered in this video, check back to the Harsh Rules channel for the final tutorial. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.